My name is Lamar Bailey Caramanites. I am from Panama and I am one of the co-facilitators of the UNARC coalition together with my colleague Salima Hankins and ISHR. The UNARC coalition is the organizer of this event. For a little bit of context um, about the coalition, we are a global civil society coalition that grew organically to push for the effective follow-up at the Human Rights Council of Resolution 43-1. Um, the mobilization um, of the coalition has largely contributed to the council's adoption of Resolution 47-21. Coalition members pushed for the creation of the independent expert mechanism present here today, as well as the key issues that the resolution addressed. The wide and sustained civil society mobilization led by families of victims of police violence has resulted in setting a critical precedent at the council, centering impacted communities, in particular victims of violations and their families. We created this space here today um, in this spirit, to continue to center the words and the voices of those who are directly impacted by police and state violence, and to give access to families and human rights defenders um, to UN spaces. This space is called Resisting Police Violence, Demanding Justice and Accountability for Victims of Systemic Racism. Um, uh, and we created the space for people's stories, experiences, perspectives, and solutions to be heard as we know from years of experience that one mechanism, one event, or one space cannot solve systemic racism. However, we still have to center the voices of those people who are directly impacted by police and state violence. If you have any questions for the families, please put those questions in the chat with your name, your email address, and your affiliation, if any. Um, and the family members or the organizers will get back to you after the event. Now, I will pass the space to Iki Jos. Um, she is a Caribbean Afro-diasporic transporter artist, performer, and anti-racist activist. And we are honored to have her here today as our moderator. Hola, buenas tardes a todas, a todos y a todes. Gracias por esta invitación para reclamar justicia. ¿Pueden oírme? Pueden hacer, yes. Bendiciones a todas, a todos y a todes, eh, las que estamos acá. Somos el sueño de nuestras ancestras. Somos lo que nuestras ancestras deseamos y es una bendición estar acá vivas pidiendo justicia en contra del racismo y la violencia estructural hacia las personas negras y afrodescendientes. Me voy a presentar. Uh, soy un cuerpo trans fugitivo de una plantación del Caribe a otra plantación acá en España. Soy hermana de Ciso, quien fue asesinado de un disparo en la cabeza por cuerpos sicariales en complicidad con el aparato policial paramilitar. Soy la sobrina de Nelson Flores, un negro asesinado por la brutalidad policial uh, y por todas las estrategias de la necropolítica y de la invasión policial en barrios y favelas negras, empobrecidas, y donde mayormente habitan personas afrodescendientes afroindígenas y cimarrones. Fui amenazada con una pistola en mi cabeza por grupos paramilitares como parte del exterminio de cuerpos trans y afrodescendientes por tener un discurso crítico ante la transfobia y el racismo de Estado. Fui solicitante de protección internacional de España y fue negado a esta plantación llamada España no protege a nadie y mucho menos personas negras y migrantes. España tiene una ley de extranjería que segrega personas migrantes. España tiene siete cárceles para personas migrantes. España realiza cada día y cada noche reas por perfil étnico racial persiguiendo migrantes y a trabajadoras sexuales. Y en España las personas trans no tenemos derecho a acceder a un nombre propio, las personas transmigrantes, 
no tenemos derecho a tener un documento de identidad que reconozca nuestra autopercepción de género. Y este encuentro es para pedir justicia a los estados racistas, una justicia transformadora, una justicia sanadora. Y justicia significa que ninguna persona negra sea asesinada. Justicia significa que desaparezcan las cárceles, las fronteras, y que las personas de la comunidad LGTB y trabajadoras sexuales tengan posibilidades de vivir. Uh, como dice Concepción Evaristo, una pensadora negra brasileña, las personas negras combinamos no morir, las personas negras acordamos no morir, y por eso estamos acá juntas. Gracias por escuchar y bienvenidas a todas, a todos y a todes. Eh, vamos a ir dando la palabra y tendrán un espacio limitado y sé que son historias difíciles, historias de dolor uh, y estamos acá para acompañarnos. Recuerdo que pueden dejar los comentarios en el chat eh, que están acá y les irán contestando progresivamente. Eh, pasamos ahora a escuchar a compañeras de Brasil y pedimos atención, tendrán aproximadamente uh, un tiempo de seis minutos, si no me equivoco pueden corregirme, de participación y damos la palabra primero a Vanessa Francisco Sales, Bruna da Silva y Ana Paula Oliveira. Vanessa Francisco Sales, una madre de Agatha Victoria Sales Fénix, que estaba con su madre en una furgoneta cuando la policía le disparó por la espalda durante una operación en el complejo de la favela alemán en septiembre del 2019. Bruna da Silva, su hijo fue asesinado eh, con su uniforme escolar camino a la escuela en Brasil y Ana Paula Oliveira, su hijo fue asesinado por la policía. Ella cofundó eh, Madres de Manguiños para hacer una campaña por la justicia de su hijo y para los niños en Brasil. Podemos escuchar. Olá, bom dia, todos me ouvem? Eu sou Vanessa, né? Eu vou só retificar aqui, eu sou mãe que estava com a filha Agatha Felix dentro de uma Kombi, indo para casa, né? E a minha filha foi executada, né? Por um policial militar. Uh, hoje eu luto, né? Para a justiça, para ser voz para minha filha, né? Eu não participo de movimento. Eu sempre venho aqui para poder dar a voz à minha filha, porque mesmo fisicamente ela não estando aqui, né? Eu que a justiça venha a ser feita, está em tribunais, mas que a sentença ainda não saiu. Então, eu e minha filha de oito anos, né, estávamos indo para casa depois de um dia que a Agatha fez prova na escola, estava uniformizada, sim, e eu tinha ido buscá-la no colégio, nós tínhamos que fazer um passeio, e no retorno para casa, é, ela foi executada. Né, pelo esse policial militar. Ela estava no meu colo e é muito doloroso, né? Sempre eu estar expondo é, é, essa situação, mas é que é muito necessário, né? Nós estarmos aqui para falar, né? De todo o preconceito, né? Que que a gente viveu, que o policial diz que ter visto algo e atirou sem ver quem estava à sua volta uma menina inocente, uma menina que tinha tantos sonhos, estava planejando tanta coisa para ela e que, infelizmente, isso não vai poder se realizar. Né? Esse ano ela completaria 11 anos, já vai fazer três anos da partida da Ágata. É, gente, é muito difícil eu estar falando, tá? Eu tô só para eu não chorar aqui. E... Só respirar mais um pouquinho. Ela completaria 11 anos em março, dia 31. Né? É uma data que... É, 
eu tento sempre ver com outros olhos essa data, porque ela era uma menina muito especial, né? como qualquer outro filho para qualquer outra mãe. Mas nós, mães, que passamos por esse tipo de situação, é bem doloroso. E ainda mais não de um local que nós vivemos. Né? E por, um, por uma pessoa que a gente tem os olhos de que teria que nos proteger. E aconteceu essa tragédia em minha vida, né? essa reviravolta. Já tem quase três anos. E há três anos eu chego em casa com uma esperança de ter um dia melhor de acordar e não ouvir mais outras notícias que outras crianças se foram ou que outra pessoa tenha sido executada né, dentro da nossa comunidade, porque parece que nós estamos perdendo o direito de ir e vir de onde nós estamos. Né? A gente sai com aquele medo de voltar. Como que a gente vai voltar? Será que eu consigo entrar? Será que está tudo ok na nossa comunidade? Então, assim, é muito difícil. Né? Eu vivo todos os dias tentando ser melhor a cada dia. Não, graças a Deus, eu não me adoeci, porque uma situação dessa leva uma pessoa realmente a adoecer. Eu sou mãe, a Agatha saiu de mim. Eu sinto muita, 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 muita falta dela. Né? Ela era minha companheira, ela era minha amiga. É, a Agatha tinha oito anos, mas ela entendia tudo que a gente vivia, tudo que eu conversava com ela, a Agatha entendia. A Agatha gostava de fazer atividades, a Agatha era exemplar na escola, né? dez em matemática, português, então assim, era uma menina muito estudiosa, desenhava assim como ninguém, é, hoje eu sinto muita falta das cartinhas que ela me fazia e me mandava. Então, assim, é muito... É muito doloroso, é muito doloroso viver. Né? Mas aí eu, eu tenho uma espiritualidade, né? eu creio em Deus, eu tenho fé. E é isso que continua me mantendo viva, né? de pé para eu continuar falando, para eu continuar lutando, para eu continuar aqui, né? expondo essa situação para vocês, para que nesse, nesse Brasil, né? eu acho que está em tudo, né? essas políticas, esses governantes, eles deveriam que ver umas normas diferentes, né? para que nós possamos ter a liberdade de, de ir e vir, né? sem medo, de onde, de onde a gente mora, sem medo de, de onde nós estamos, né? E não só eu, né? Tem outras mães, não, a Agatha não foi a primeira, a Agatha não foi a, a do meio, e a Agatha não, não foi a última, né? Que, infelizmente, essas, essas situações ainda continuam. Infelizmente, as situações ainda continuam, porque nós precisamos continuar falando, precisamos continuar gritando, precisamos continuar unindo as vozes. Eu acho que as vozes unidas, as atitudes, fazem a diferença no grande mundo né? que a gente vive, porque a gente vive num país grande. O país é rico, né? o país é rico. Ele poderia continuar investindo na educação para as crianças dentro das comunidades, eles poderiam continuar com os projetos dentro da comunidade que a gente não se vê mais. A gente não vê mais aqueles projetos né, que tinham para a criança é, se ocupar, a criança gostar, a criança crescer, a criança ter, sabe, evolução e ter um futuro. Né? Parece que nós estamos vivendo num momento que querem exterminar todo mundo. Né? Quem tem poder, tem poder. Quem tem, aí e daí? Né? Não estão nem aí. Né? Então, por isso que esses movimentos, esses encontros são importantes para nossas vozes serem exaladas, irem aonde quer que nós estejamos, para que nós possamos continuar forte, para continuar lutando né? Pelo, pela justiça, que tem casos, o meu é um dos casos que ainda está na justiça, né? tem esse processo já há três anos, que foram várias audiências, foram três audiências é, alteradas, é, que foram que foram para frente, né? 
e que a gente, eu estou aguardando e é muito doloroso estar dentro de um tribunal né? e você ali está com aquela com réu frente a frente né? e ele falar coisas que não aconteceu. Então, assim, é muito doloroso e ter aquelas testemunhas com réu e falar situações assim que parece, sabe, não está nem aí. Ah, não foi eu? Sabe, não foi eu, então não estou nem aí. É muito crucificante, é muito doloroso. A cada dia que a gente vive parece que está pior, sabe? Parece que está pior. E a gente, todos os dias, precisamos levantar, precisamos unir as nossas vozes para que nós possamos é, ir né, adiante. Né? Esses encontros, irem adiante para ir ao mundo mesmo, para gritar e falar, chega, né? Chega, precisa ter um basta, precisa ter basta, tantos preconceitos, eu tive a nossa colega que foi ameaçada, pediu ajuda, em nenhum momento, sabe, ajudar a nossa colega, né, o preconceito tá em todos os lugares, não tá só em mim, não tá só no colega, tá em todos, então esses encontros sim, são importantes para que nós possamos unir a cada dia mais e mais e ser fortes e potentes, para que nós possamos ser diferentes e ter mudanças para cada um, para o nosso país, para as organizações. E é isso, gente. Obrigada pelo convite, obrigada pela voz, obrigada por estar aqui. Que nós possamos continuar. Gracias, gracias a ti por tus palabras, por compartir este dolor. Eh, te acompañamos y estamos juntas aquí uh, pidiendo justicia. Ahora vamos a escuchar a Bruna da Silva, también de Brasil. Adelante, Bruna, cuando quieras. Bom dia a todos y a todos. Gostaría de comenzar esta audiencia mandando un beijo para Vanessa. Dizer para a Vanessa que a gente estamos juntos na luta e fora dela. Eu sou moradora do conjunto de favelas da Maré, uma favela que compõe 16 favelas num complexo só. Sou mãe de filho vitimado e morto pelo Estado. Marcos Vinícius foi assassinado por um policial da CORE com roupa e material de escola. É, eu estou no mês de junho, que é o mês de morte do meu filho. Dia 20 agora fez quatro anos da morte dele. Há quatro anos essa mãe se jogou nos direitos humanos para apontar o assassino do seu filho. Há, três, há quatro anos eu estou com vocês nos direitos humanos, defendendo vidas, porque nossos corpos importam. Ai, Marcos Vinícius me fez uma pergunta quando eu cheguei no UPA. Ele, mãe, pelo amor de Deus, a polícia não me viu com roupa e material de escola. O que que fiz, mãe, a polícia? O blindado não me viu? E eu tenho essa pergunta comigo até hoje, que é uma pergunta que me fere, que me machuca, porque eu não tenho essa resposta. Há quatro anos, essa mãe quer que o processo do filho dela saia da mão da DH, porque a DH ela senta com a bunda em cima do processo dos nossos filhos e não investiga. A minha luta é o quê? O policial civil que matou, a civil não tem que ter o poder de investigar esse caso, porque eles não estão aí para investigar. O policial que atirou no meu filho, ele me conhece e eu não conheço ele. Até hoje, eu não tenho o nome dos policiais que estavam dentro do blindado e na calçada naquele dia 20 de junho de 2018. Eu quero... Eu espero uma resposta da justiça e a minha luta é para isso, é que a justiça venha prevalecer, que ela venha existir. Eu quero 
que o processo do meu filho, que o inquérito vire um processo e que vá para a mão do juiz. Eu quero ir para o júri, eu quero que o caso venha a ser investigado a fundo, porque quem investiga o caso dos nossos filhos somos nós mães e familiares. O Estado mata e matou, ninguém responde. Tá? Marcos Vinícius era um menino cheio de sonho, meu primeiro filho, meu primeiro amor. Marcos Vinícius que me ensinou o significado de amar. Marcos Vinícius que me ensinou a ser mãe. Se hoje eu sou uma boa mãe para minha única filha que o Estado deixou, foi porque eu aprendi com o Marcos. E eu estou aqui para dar voz ao Marcos Vinícius e a tantos outros que estão tombados. A Maria Eduarda foi executada dentro da escola e até hoje a família da Maria Eduarda espera uma resposta. Eu queria entender que a amorosidade é essa com o caso dos nossos filhos. Que justiça lenta é essa só com os nossos casos. Então, a gente queremos proteção para nós, militantes de direitos humanos, porque nós somos alvos. Eu corro perigo aqui dentro da maré, porque é eu que dou voz, é eu que falo, é eu que denuncio o que o Estado vem fazendo com a gente. Há três dias atrás, teve uma operação aqui na maré, em Marcílio Dias, aonde que a PM invadiu o Marcílio Dias usando uma ambulância da cegonha, aquela ambulância que vai pegar gestante passando mal para levar para a maternidade. O Estado entrou usando uma ambulância dessa e conseguiu executar duas pessoas. Então, tipo, é umas coisas dessas que não deixa apavorada, abismada, porque a gente vê o um Estado, uma segurança pública, matando a gente. Então, que Estado é esse? Quem é o homem mal da história? Quem é o bonzinho? Quem, quem, quem é o bandido da história? Então, a gente está aqui para apontar e denunciar essas coisas que vem acontecendo com a gente. A gente não vai parar. A gente juramos de não morrer, não foi, colega? Então, a gente não vai morrer porque a gente vai lutar. Nossos corpos importam, nossas vidas importam, todos nós importa. Então, a gente tem que ter o direito de ir e vir, sim, porque é um direito nosso. E a gente quer esse direito, a gente quer um respeito. Nós somos favelados, somos periféricos, somos pobres, mas somos nós que movimentamos essa sociedade e este país. Porque se não fosse nós, a classe trabalhadora, o que seria desse país? A gente estamos voltando para a fome, a inflação está lá em cima, a gasolina está a horrores e nem carro eu tenho e estou pagando um preço. A gente não consegue mais comer, porque você vai na rua para fazer uma compra, você não vem com uma compra, porque está tudo caro, enquanto o rico come e a, e a, e a sociedade que trabalha está passando fome. Eu não acho certo a gente trabalhar para movimentar o cofre público e passar fome, morrer na fila dos hospitais. A gente não aceita esse tratamento. A gente queremos ser olhado, a gente queremos um Estado democrático de direito. A nossa luta é por reparação, memória e justiça. E que juntos somos mais fortes. Eu quero agradecer o meu espaço, desejar muito axé, muita fé, amor para todo mundo, porque a gente temos luz e é essa luz que vai nos impulsionar e botar a gente para frente. E tomo junto, galera. Vamos junto. Beijo. Muchas gracias, Luna. Es importante lo que dices. Juramos que no vamos a morir, estamos juntas y además con las bendiciones de las ancestras. Así que, Ashe, poder para ti. Gracias por abrir tu corazón acá. Vamos a escuchar a otra hermana, Ana Paula Oliveira. Cuando quieras, tienes el tiempo. Olá, é, quero agradecer o convite para estar aqui hoje com vocês. É, eu sou Ana Paula Oliveira, sou a mãe do Jonathan. É, o Jonathan ele tinha 19 anos quando ele foi assassinado é, pela polícia com um tiro nas costas. 
Meu filho foi assassinado aqui na favela de Manguins. Manguins é uma favela que fica situada na zona norte da cidade do Rio de Janeiro. E quando o meu filho foi assassinado, a pergunta que eu me fazia, eu né, jogava assim, perguntava por quê? Por quê? Por quê? Né? E a partir do momento que, que eu saio de Manguins e encontro outras mães, eu tenho essa resposta. Né? Porque quando eu encontro é, essas outras mulheres, são todas mulheres negras, pobres, moradoras de favela, periferias, e os seus filhos é, também é, jovens negros, crianças negras. Então, é, é preciso dizer que essa violência ela não nos atinge por um acaso. Essa violência ela, ela tem um alvo, e esse alvo ele tem cor, ele tem um, 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 um CEP, né? e a partir daí, a partir desse entendimento, eu ganho mais força para lutar por justiça, pela verdade, mas, acima de tudo, é uma luta pela vida é, das pessoas que moram na favela. Pois as favelas são territórios habitados, em sua maioria, pela população preta. Né? E é preciso né, combater, é preciso combater esse racismo. O Brasil ele é, sim, um país racista que mata, que encarcera, que tortura e que desaparece com a sua, com a sua população preta, com o povo preto. E hoje o que me dá forças para seguir é poder, de alguma forma, contribuir para essa luta da vida do nosso povo. A partir do momento em que o meu filho é assassinado, eu conheço outra mãe e, ela... e a gente resolve juntar forças. Essa mãe é a Fátima Pinho, Mãe do Paulo Roberto, um jovem de 18 anos, que também foi assassinado pela polícia aqui em Manguinhos. E a gente decide juntar forças e lutar. Lutar contra todas as mentiras que a polícia alegou, tentando é, dar legitimidade aos assassinatos dos nossos filhos. A gente resolve lutar para apoiar outras mães, outras mulheres negras que também tiveram seus direitos violados, que também tiveram seus filhos arrancados da sua convivência. E aí a gente forma o movimento das mães de Manguinhos, que é um movimento onde a gente acolhe essas mães, esses familiares, e também fazemos formação política com essas mulheres, para que tenha esse entendimento do porquê buscar por essa justiça. Né? E porque quem está morrendo são nossos filhos, jovens, crianças, mulheres pretas. E quem está adoecendo com essa dor são as mulheres negras. Nós que somos linha de frente na proteção dos nossos, na proteção das nossas famílias, na luta pelos nossos direitos, nós que temos nossos filhos arrancados do nosso convívio, nós é que estamos é, adoecendo e morrendo também. Então, existe uma política voltada para o nosso extermínio. E essa política precisa ser combatida. Outra coisa que eu preciso falar é sobre esse sistema de justiça que também nos adoece. Esse sistema de justiça que tem dois pesos e duas medidas e que não nos atende. Como é possível uma mãe que tem o seu filho assassinado com um tiro nas costas ter que esperar oito anos 
para que uma justiça aconteça. Enquanto isso, o policial que mata os nossos filhos, eles seguem livres com a certeza da impunidade, com a certeza de que podem entrar na favela e continuar matando. A gente não pode é, seguir indiferente a esses, a, a esses homicídios. Eu acho que essa luta não pode ser só das mães que perdem seus filhos. Acho que tem que ser uma luta de todos. E é por isso que eu estou aqui hoje, para tentar mobilizar todo mundo para que esteja nessa luta pelas vidas nas favelas. É isso. Gracias, Ana Paula. Gracias, compartimos tu dolor. Y esto me hace pensar en una, una pensadora afro-brasileña también que habla de la doloridad y es este dolor compartido entre las personas negras. Estamos en la diáspora resistiendo a la masacre y al exterminio que todavía sigue en pie. Agradezco a todas las madres brasileñas por su testimonio tan poderoso, por abrir su corazón y hacer este dolor colectivo y estamos juntas y vamos a hacer todo lo posible juntas para pedir justicia y para que esto no vuelva a pasar y nuestros hermanos y nuestros familiares uh, puedan, puedan tener justicia. Muchas gracias. Recordamos también a la audiencia que tiene, si tienen preguntas, que pueden escribirla en el chat con su nombre, correo y afiliación, si tienen alguna, y la familia responderá después del evento. Continuamos eh, con este encuentro y vamos a presentar ahora a María Mercedes Manjarres de Colombia. Eh, es la hermana de Martín Manjarres, joven de 16 años, presuntamente asesinado por miembros de la Policía Nacional de Colombia en febrero del 2021. Y Ana María Mercedes, cuando quieras, tienes la palabra. Buenos días, buenas, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, quiero agradecer por esta invitación, por este espacio. Eh, me siento eh, con muchas emociones al escuchar a todas estas madres que, que también están pasando por una pérdida como, como la mía, como la de mi familia. Yo soy del, de Cartagena de Indias, la ciudad turística, la ciudad heroica, pero una ciudad que también está oculta con muertes injustas. Eh, mi hermano solamente tenía 16 años, se llamaba Martín Elías y una noche del domingo del 7 de febrero de 2021, más o menos a eso de las 11 y cuarto de, de la noche fue asesinado por un policía eh, en Cartagena. Mi hermano, como cualquier joven, regresaba de un domingo de, de estar eh, disfrutando charla con otros eh, vecinos de la cuadra cuando de repente se encuentran con una patrulla de la policía el cuadrante como, como decimos nosotros acá en Colombia eh, se encontraron de frente con ellos y estábamos en esa época donde estaba el, el pico y cédula la restricción por, por el tema del COVID y pues mi hermano como siempre es obediente a los consejos de mi madre para llevar los protocolos de seguridad, en este caso su tapabocas, se encuentran de frente con la patrulla y, y de un momento a otro eh, esta institución siempre nos ha infundido como ese miedo que apenas que los vemos eh, soltamos la expresión de que eh, ahí viene la policía y salimos corriendo, nos metemos en nuestras casas y mi hermano junto con los dos muchachos que venían cruzaron una valla de un, de un lote baldío. Mi hermano, por, por poseer una contextura algo grande y, y, y gruesa, él no pudo pasar la valla, se quedó atascado en la valla. Los otros muchachos sí pudieron cruzar. cruzar. Eh, dado a eso, el policía que iba manejando la moto aceleró y, y le dio una patada en la cara, a lo cual el otro policía se baja 
y le dispara por la espalda. Mi hermano como pudo caminó ciertos metros en ese lote baldío y, y se desplomó. Yo le agradezco enormemente a la vida que haya sido la comunidad que haya auxiliado a mi hermano, porque el nivel de corrupción que vemos de estas instituciones lo que hacen es plantarles un arma, drogas y, y hacer pasar de que era un delincuente. Eh, Cartagena ha sido bastante atropellada por, por estos abusos de esta institución. ¿Cómo puedo tenerle fe a este, a este sistema donde diariamente nos viven matando por nuestro color de piel, por el barrio donde provenimos, eh, por lo que somos? Porque quiero ratificar y decir que la policía tiene que ser consciente de que están llevando armas y que son letales de que no pueden asumir que cualquier joven que vaya por la calle lleve un arma, de que es un delincuente, de que no entiendo por qué, porque aquí ahorita mismo no radica la pregunta de que por qué matan a Martín, sino para qué matan a Martín. ¿Sí? Eh, como Martín, mueren a diario muchos y, y envío mi, mi brazo fraterno para todas las madres en Brasil que han estado comentando su historia. Yo estoy aquí en representación de mi papá y de mi mamá. Mi madre es una mujer que hoy en día no tiene visión de felicidad porque mataron al tercer de sus hijos, al consentido, al menor de la casa. Un, un joven que, que, que tenía muchos sueños, muchas aspiraciones, de que no entiendo eh, del por qué siempre la policía tenga esta déspota expresión de que solo sigo órdenes y es mi trabajo. No entiendo por qué eh, utilizan, utilizan esa expresión para tratar de, de tapar algo que es tan real. Estamos frente a un sistema de que no, no, no importa eh, de dónde provenimos. Nos matan, y lo vuelvo a decir, nos matan por nuestra raza, nos matan por nuestra humildad, nos matan por cualquier cosa. Y siempre he dicho, correr no es, un delito, no es un delito, matar sí. Hoy por eso le pido a todas las personas que están escuchando de que no nos detengamos, que sigamos firmes, que sigamos constantes, de que yo también me uno a esta causa, de que yo también quiero gritar mi dolor a donde quiera que vaya, de que no tengo miedo y que creo que mantengo la, la esperanza de que en este, en este nuevo gobierno que se está sentando en Colombia pueda unirse más con los derechos humanos, con las Naciones Unidas, hacer más acuerdos, más coaliciones, a que ya no es pedir, llorar, es exigir nuestro derecho a la vida. Porque yo puedo desmenuzar el decálogo de todos los derechos que se le violaron a mi hermano, pero se le violó el más importante y era el derecho a la vida. Así que nada, gracias por escucharme, gracias por sentirnos y desde acá les envío un fuerte abrazo. Los abrazo mucho desde la distancia. Gracias María Mercedes por tu testimonio. Y te tomo la palabra porque son estas preguntas que a veces no tienen respuesta. ¿no? ¿Cómo, cómo, ¿Cómo tener fe en este sistema? ¿Y quién repara también el dolor? Nuestro dolor que es un dolor irreparable. Estas preguntas duelen y son difíciles, ¿no? ¿Para qué matan a Martín? ¿Para qué matan a otros cuerpos? ¿no? Uh, es, es muy doloroso esto y, y agradezco nuevamente haber compartido esto y estamos juntas desde los lugares donde nos encontremos, nos acompañamos y creo que esto es un acto que refleja eso. Y vamos a seguir este encuentro, vamos a escuchar el testimonio de Nasingua Amida de Uganda. Ella es una activista y organizadora uh, que vive actualmente en un campo de refugiados y ha sido objeto de ataques por parte de la policía de ese país. Y el tiempo es tuyo y la palabra es tuya, Nasimba. Hi everyone. Am I audible enough? Yes, we can hear you.
Yeah, my network is not the best. I'm happy to be here. Oh, that's good then. I'm a human. Right defender and activist movements for and towards the 2021 general elections, they started abducting and killing women and youth. For us, it is a different case because this unit abducting and, ki and, and killing citizens. Myself, I have been into the torture chambers. I have been public. harassed by police and because of the way we have followed up, we came to realize it is not the police that puts on police killing and harassing people, abducting children, missing, yes. I was going to um, suggest that maybe if you turned your, I know we would love to see you, but maybe the reception would be better if you turn the camera off just because it's cutting in and out a lot. And we want to really make sure we hear what you're saying. So maybe that will help. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. That's better. Please continue. I have switched. Okay. So I have I have had several stories here by the ladies. I really stand in solidarity with you and say energy. We shall overcome some directions. Most of of my colleagues were abducted and killed and buried in mass graves in Marira Fest in Uganda, never surfaced. We have not heard from any progress about their whereabouts from their families. And the migrants have also been killed. They have been jailed. Um, many are missing. And it's a terrible situation in Uganda because The president, the dictator, transfer power to his son by force. Because we are dealing with an, an occupation, the way you see Palestine and Israel, we are being occupied. Okay. Um. Nassim, well, I, uh, you're going in and out quite a bit, so it's um, it's difficult to for us to hear you. Can you hear us? Yeah, I think I know that um, we spoke yesterday and she was having some um, connectivity issues where she is now. Um, I think we'll give it a, a second longer. If not, maybe uh, we can circle back to her when she has better reception, hopefully, and then we could have her tell her story because it's really important. But um, but it's yeah, it looks like she she dropped off. So I think we should move on to the next person, and then I will chat with with her privately to see how her reception is, and then we can move on from there. I hope you don't mind if I just cut in Iki. Um, when she's available. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. So we can move okay. on to the next person.
Eh, la siguiente persona sería Adrian Hood uh, de los Estados Unidos y le escuchamos cuando Adrian Hood es madre de Henry Green quien fue asesinado en Columbus, Ohio, en Estados Unidos, por parte de la policía civil eh, el 6 de junio del 2016, y te escuchamos cuando quieras. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes. We can hear you clearly. Awesome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are in the world. Um, I thank you all for the opportunity to be able to be here and to share uh, my son's story. Um, again, my name is Adrian Hood and I am a Mothers Against Police Brutality Fellow Legacy. And I am also the mother of Henry Green V who was killed by two plainclothes police officers um, under the Columbus Division of Police here in Columbus, Ohio in 2016. Um, I have a total of three children. I have one daughter and two sons and Henry um, is my oldest son. I am also the grandmother of four and I am a retired master sergeant from the United States Air Force. Um, on June 6th, of 2016, uh, my son Henry was walking with one of his friends uh, back to my sister's house when he was stalked by two plainclothes police officers. Um, and I call him Bubby. So if you hear me say that somewhere in here, um, that is what I typically call him. So I apologize. Um, and I don't want anyone to get lost in who I am referring to. Um, but affectionately, he is lovely to me. Um, but I will try to stick with Henry so we can minimize the confusion. Um, but like I said, uh, June 6, uh, 2016, my son uh, was walking with one of his friends back to my sister's house. And these two police officers in an unmarked SUV uh, with tinted windows and Florida tags um, almost hit Henry as he was crossing the street with his friend. As they continued on and got to the next street, uh, these same police officers uh, came up the next street at a high rate of speed with their, their guns drawn in the window. Um, and they began shooting at my son without provocation. And at the end of that, Henry was shot eight times. They fired 22 bullets um, and eight of those hit my son and he succumbed to his injuries. We were told at the hospital that Henry did not make it but I truly believe that my son died on the sidewalk alone. But nonetheless, uh, once they told me where my son was, we went to the hospital, we were taken to a room with a detective and hospital staff. The security at the hospital was very disrespectful. And that was my introduction into what we were going to experience as a family. The hospital staff told us that my son did not make it. And so the next time that I see him was in a casket at the funeral home. My son had scratches on his face and I didn't understand why until I seen the dash cam from a police cruiser who had responded to the scene that day. And I saw how they snatched my son's arm 
and flipped his lifeless body over and handcuffed him. They didn't treat him as a human being at all. I'll never forget the phone call from my sister and her screaming into the phone that my son had been killed. And I'm confused because I'm wondering who would want to hurt him. And it was from that moment that I realized that it was the police department and these police officers. I still remember the interview that very first night when they said suspect was standing on the corner brandishing a weapon. And I also remember how quickly that story changed when witnesses started to come forth and tell the actual story because this was a nice summer day, similar to what we are experiencing here today in Columbus, Ohio. Children were out playing, not just adults, but children were out playing as well. Then again, these officers fired 22 shots in the community. From the very onset of this unnecessary tragedy, my family has been disrespected. One of the first things that the detective said to me and my son's father when we met with them was that he seen my son wasn't a felon. As if that mattered. When I was at the hospital, I asked to see my son. And they told me no, because he was evidence. So I never got to touch him warm again. I didn't get to see him take his last breath. None of that, none of the things that a mother should be afforded when her child has been harmed. Neither one of these police officers was ever indicted. There was no trial. There was no conviction. And three weeks after they were cleared from killing my son, one of the officers was caught on camera stomping the head of a handcuffed Black man. Three weeks after being clear of killing my son. And the city later settled with that young man. Unlike my son, he did survive. But if he had been fired when he killed my son, this latter incident of police brutality would not have ever happened. It makes me sick to think of the many mothers across the world who are told similar things in situations such as ours. It's just sickening. And it speaks to the culture of policing in the US. But as I sit here and listen to everyone else, I also realize that it's across the world. The treatment of our loved ones is inhumane. They are trained to kill, not disable, trained to kill, plain and simple. And that is exactly what they did to Henry on that day. They killed my son and they had no remorse for killing him. And after almost six years, we finally made it to trial for our civil suit. After winning an appeal, my family, Henry's father, his sister, his brother, uncles and aunts, we all waited six long years for some type of justice. But it took the jury less than two hours to come back from deliberations and side with the officers. I will absolutely never ever 
understand how they were able to go through that many exhibits, that type of evidence, that type of testimony, and still side with the officers. I truly believe that their minds were already made up. One of the most grueling moments for me during the trial, which would never be reported by the media, of course, was when I heard the officer on the stand say, he guessed he could have just ran my son over. He gave this response as part of his testimony and cross-examination from my attorney. He guessed he could have ran my son over. I had to sit there and show no reaction. It was like swallowing razors. It was definitely a message to me and the jury that Henry's life did not matter. I feel like the appeal, even though they ruled in our favor, was ruled in such a way that the officers would be victorious. They were caught in so many lies during testimony. But again, because of the ruling in the appeal, a lot of the testimony could not even be considered. There has been no accountability with this police department, even though the Department of Justice has already come in and found our police department guilty of racism and excessive force. There has been no oversight to make sure that the changes that were agreed upon were kept. And as egregious as my story is, and as horrible as it sounds, it is not unique in nature in the United States. And again, as I see across the world, I have a fellow cohort whose name is Monty Benjamin and her son, Javis Benjamin, was killed January 18th of 2013 by a police officer in Avondale Estates Police Department in DeKalb County, Georgia. In Javis's case, unlike my sons, the officers were indicted. This officer was indicted. It was the district attorney who decided not to have a case against this police officer. I don't even know how that can be. There is a system in place that is supposed to be a checks and balances. And yet we see another story where it is completely bankrupt. American police have gotten away with murder since its inception. Conceived from slave patrols that developed in the Southern Police Departments well over 200 years ago. Fast forward to 2022, the same brutalizing, and terrorizing of communities of black, brown, and poor people is still very much a part of the American fabric when it comes to policing. I ask that we all stand together and push for the changes that need to take place. The UN has already found the US guilty of police brutality. It is said it is written, the documentation can be pulled up anywhere. How are we going to hold them accountable? How will we protect black and brown children when they are walking, when they are driving, when they are playing in America? And as I stated, as I sit here and I listen, to all of the stories of my sisters from across this world. How are we going to band together to protect our babies from the evilness that sits in the core of people's hearts that they are able to look at another human being 
and treat them as if they are not human, as if they are not created by the same God, what will we do together to bring about this change? I am not looking for reformation. I am looking for transformation. I don't want this system to be corrected. This system needs to be destroyed. It needs to be destroyed. And then we will build it to be the public safety entity that it is supposed to be. And then we can say that the individuals in uniform are there to protect and to serve. Not a selected few, but for all that they have taken the oath to do so. I thank you for your time. I absolutely am praying and lifting each and every family up because this pain is an everlasting pain. It does not go away. We just learn to continue to move on because we have a community to protect. We have other loved ones to protect. So again, I lift you all up in my prayers. I know that God has called us to this place for a reason and we will fulfill the purpose that he has for us in this particular lane, we will do it collectively. God bless you all, and I love you all. Thank you, Adrian. So we are together. Thank you for sharing your pain. <laughs> Nasingua, Amida, eh, esperemos que ahora podamos escuchar su testimonio. Eh, introduzco a Nasingua, ella es madre de Henry Green, quien fue asesinado. No, sorry, eh, perdón. Eh, Nasimba Hamida es de Uganda. Eh, teníamos problemas de comunicación y ha vuelto. Ella es activista eh, y organizadora de. Uganda, que actualmente vive en un campo de refugiados y ha sido objeto de ataques por parte de la policía en ese país. Y te escuchamos en Nasingua, Amida. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. I'm in the camp. Um, the network is not the best. I, because, like I was telling you, I escaped death. And when I left, after like two weeks, my children were attacked in the house. They tied their mouths and started beating them, asking them for where their mother's gun is. Because the government has always victimized us for hiding guns and ammunition in the house. But uh, with the help of Kenya Human Rights Commission and Urgent Action Fund, they were evacuated and brought to Nairobi. And while in Nairobi, we survived several attempts of abduction by plain clothes military personnel. And when we went to UNHCR, we were deposited into Kakuma camp in Kenya, where we are struggling. I've heard stories from the different human rights defenders. I send you positive energy. We have to speak up regardless of what we go through. Yes. I would like to bring to your attention, uh, the members here in, that we human rights defenders and activists who are always the voice of the voiceless, we are not paid to do what we are doing. We are self-driven, we are driven by passion. Only that somewhere we are let down by the organs of the different organizations that are supposed to motivate and also hold our hand. But nonetheless, it is really a painful experience to each one of us. Like I was telling you, I was once abducted taken to a military cell 
where I found dead bodies and parts of dead of dead people. I found heads, I found arms, I found legs, and some of them were rotting. I was undressed and placed in that room. Colleagues, these are hard stories to tell. If you are not strong enough and you don't have that passion, it is hard to speak out some of these stories. So they opened the tap and the tap filled this room with water and my whole body was in that water with maggots, blood, pus of these rotting body parts and dead bodies. Imagine a woman, because I was speaking up against land grabbing in one of the neighboring villages where they were evicting 10,000 people. I became a shield to speak up for them and also guide them on how we should access justice. That is how I was abducted from my house. And then they, while I was put in a drone, there are these vehicles that have no number plates with tinted mirrors where they always throw us in. I, I hope colleagues have seen them where I was put and they were using pliers to remove my nails as a form of torture. And my right hand, hand and leg, the toys are a sign of that experience. But what do I want to ask? Organs like the UNHCR and its sister agencies. In Uganda today, many women do not know where their children are and they'll never find the bodies of those children. They cannot come out to speak. There is a very silent genocide in Uganda. People are being abducted from their houses and killed and nobody is allowed to speak up. Many activists, Many close friends have fled the country. They are in exile, just like I am in Kakuma camp. Dear UN, dear European Union, dear embassies, losing one activist is a big blow to every struggle world over. Because activists do not look for donor monies, they usually work with the people in our communities. Remember, we are working to save our communities, to save the next generation, to bring justice to that innocent citizen who has nobody to speak for him or her. If activists are not treated in a mode of motivation, we are not going to inspire the rest of the citizens to come out and speak about injustice in society. Today, I am in Kakuma camp. I'm under UNHCR. We are many mothers here, political activists who have run away from Uganda. But we are going through the worst under UNHCR. We cannot access water. We do not have food. We cannot access the UNHCR offices. We are put in the camp indefinitely, yet we have a following back home. Me, I had organized the women in different groups across the country. I have empowered the women to make their own income, to generate their own income. I've created a society of women who, who are not job seekers, but job creators. I have helped women organize them in small circles. They no longer take their property to the bank to get loans. They save their small money and make their small businesses from the skills that I have taught them like making pads, liquid soap, bath soap, 
candles mention it while i'm here what are the thousands of women that were relying on me in all aspects politically economically and socially what are they up to remember we have mobilized these communities and majority the biggest percentage of of these women these constituents they are illiterate they cannot read, read and write but they need to survive me as their convener i'm now struggling and suffering in the camp i have raised my voice beyond all levels to be helped out of the camp so that i can continue with my advocacy work i have not been heard salma i thank you for this opportunity you were a great woman you were a woman of honor and all the organizers colleagues i really want to get out of this camp to continue fighting for the rights and freedoms of the ordinary women while in the camp we are with our children they are not going to school they are seated this is the fourth year while my children are not going to school remember from that traumatizing situation where we used to be attacked by police because of the different protests we were organizing that background is still on their head and while here there would be maybe convincing situation would be when they go to school colleagues under unhcr a un agency children of activists grassroots activists and human rights defenders are not given the opportunity to go and get education i need your help i need your solidarity to help the grassroots woman in uganda whose children are lying in different forests they have been dumped into lake victoria they have been dumped into many lake uh, lakes and water bodies and they can never get justice i thank you so much there are some stories i'm trying to hesitate to tell because i'll get more emotional but i stand in solidarity with all of you the women here who have shared your painful stories i send you positive energy colleagues we need your assistance in kakuma camp as soon as possible thank you thank you nasingwa thank you for your energy we are together you are a strong one let's see bendiciones eres una mujer fuerte y muchas gracias por visibilizar la violencia en los campos los campos de refugiados eh, en esos espacios de la migración que son muy violentos yo soy una persona que estaba solicitando refugio y he vivido en espacios uh, en casas de acogida con personas migrantes refugiadas mujeres y disidencias sexuales y son espacios violentos y de depresión y aquí en España tenemos centros de internamiento de extranjeros que también son centros donde vive la violencia estatal y el racismo estructural y entiendo tu testimonio gracias por compartir Vamos a continuar. Uh, ahora vamos a escuchar a Ejim Dike de Nigeria y los Estados Unidos. Ella es una defensora de los derechos humanos y la política social con más de 20 años de experiencia sobre el terreno. Tiene una amplia experiencia en alfabetización, en el uso de leyes, mecanismos de derechos humanos, especialmente en las Naciones Unidas para activistas de base. Cuando quieras, Ejim, te escuchamos. 
Thank you, Iki. Can you hear me? Fine. Okay, great. Yes. Um, good afternoon, good morning to all, and thank you um, to the organizers and to all the women who have shared your very painful stories. We are to stand in solidarity with you, um, and my heart is full of grief. Um, I'm Ajim DK, um, and I will be speaking today to give voice to the many victims of the Nigerian police force. In October of 2020, the problem of police violence in Nigeria was exposed to the world through what was called the NSARS movement. Um, I have to say I'm, I was not directly impacted by NSARS. However, I'm a Nigerian and have had my own um, personal interactions and have been directly impacted by Nigerian police force as well as my family. Uh, but we think we thought it was important to share what happened in Nigeria and continues to happen in Nigeria, representing also that part of the African continent. So NSARS was a Nigerian movement, for those of you who don't know, that was calling for the dissolution of a unit of the Nigerian police force called SARS, which was the Special Anti-Robbery Squad. And it was established, SARS was established to um, address the rise in violent crime and in robbery in Nigeria. But very soon, it became notorious throughout Nigeria um, for, its, for its own violent crimes, including extortion, torture, which has been reported, had been reported prior to 2020 by various outlets around the world and extrajudicial killings. On October 3rd of 2020, a video of a young man who had been killed by a SARS officers started circulating on social media and it sparked a mass protest across Nigeria, which be became um, a global movement, particularly um, on social media. In response, President Buhari of Nigeria uh, decided, announced that he was disbanding SARS, but the protest continued. Why? Because it was not the first time that um, the SARS, or that unit had been disbanded um, and then only to be reconstituted. And one of the ways in which SARS operates is that like many of you have shared, the police officers are in plain clothes. Um, they drive around in a, unidentified vehicles and that allows them, that gives them the cover to engage in illegal illicit activity with impunity. Well, during the protests, Buhari's government reacted with violence. They are believed to have sent in disruptors to attack the protesters, uh, to aggravate the protests and turn them violent. They arrested protesters, they harassed journalists. And on October 2020, about three weeks later, they orchestrated a plan that ended up in the shooting and extrajudicial killings of protesters at the Leki Togi um, in Lagos, which is the biggest city in Nigeria. The, the Buhari administration, the Nigerian government has yet to hold any law enforcement accountable for that massacre. In fact, a year later, last November in 2021, the judicial panel that was put together to investigate NSARS found that at least 49 people were either shot, dead, um, or assaulted or wounded by soldiers. Not only that, the panel found that the army stopped ambulances from getting to the toll gate and assisting wounded pro protesters. The recommendations, they recommended that compensation be um, of 500 million Naira, which I, I can't do the translation so quickly, um, uh, in dollars, 
Um, but in, in any case, they recommended compensation for the victims. And the recommendations of the um, panel have yet to be implemented. In fact, on the contrary, the administ Buhari administration has now taken to undermining the panel's legitimacy, even though this was a panel of independent um, jurists brought together. We mentioned SARS, but the problem of impunity of um, in SARS is an extreme case of what happens throughout the Nigerian police force. Um, the Nigerian police officers not only target and harass um, people they have profiled uh, as engaged in criminal activity, activity, they routinely, they use extortion and torture to investigate crimes. This happened with my own family where we reported a crime and instead the police extorted my family heavily and um, used the opportunity to really target anybody who um, could be held until um, bail was paid. Um, the problem of police in Nigeria is it's a legacy of British colonialism. The institution of policing was first established under um, the colonial British empire with emissaries from the Royal Niger Company, which is today's Unilever. And policing in Nigeria, as in Kenya, as in a lot of other uh, former British colonies, reflect British colonial policing as it existed in their colonies. Um, it was militarized, it was violent, and many of the tactics that they continue to use today, such as surveillance in the form of checkpoints are ubiquitous all through Nigeria. And those are generally sites that are used for extortion. I'll end by saying that Nigeria needs to be held accountable. Nigeria has ratified all the human rights treaties, um, major human rights treaties from the Civil and Political Rights the Convention Against Torture, Convention on the Rights of the Child, Protection from Enforced Disappearance. Nigeria has ratified them, but it routinely fails to submit state reports. We're hoping that this is an opportunity to build solidarity with others around the world, but also to use human rights mechanisms to name and shame the Nigerian government and all of our governments, Brazil, Colombia, the United States, Uganda into action. Thank you. Gracias a ti. Gracias por compartir tu testimonio y que sepas que estamos juntas eh, en este encuentro reclamando justicia y, y también una justicia sanadora porque este dolor es bastante profundo y, y es importante mantenernos unidas. Vamos a escuchar el siguiente testimonio. Um, voy a dar la palabra a Esther Mamadou desde España. Mamadou es defensora de derechos humanos con varios años de experiencia y actualmente coordinadora del programa de protección internacional de Movimiento por la Paz, una ONG española. Um, cuando quieras, eh, Esther, estamos aquí para escucharte. Thank you. I'm going to switch to Spanish channel. Hola, buenas tardes eh, a todas las personas que estáis aquí. Eh, creo que es, un, es muy duro los testimonios que estamos, que estamos oyendo y quiero eh, agradecer a las personas que habéis compartido vuestra valentía eh, porque me siento realmente perturbada. Y me doy cuenta de que después de tantos años de, de, de trabajo y experiencia me sigo sintiendo perturbada eh, frente a esta violencia sistemática eh, que no termina ¿no? contra los, los cuerpos negros. Eh, había preparado una presentación, pero por temas de tiempo, creo que vamos un poquito mal de tiempo, voy a ir al grano. Primero me gustaría confirmar a Iquios que, que sí, que, que tiene razón, que España es un estado racista. 
y que tenemos un contexto bastante particular en frontera. Y luego también le quería confirmar a Adrián, eh, creo que es eh, que efectivamente que la violencia y la impunidad y la falta de reparación y la falta de justicia es global y que efectivamente todo esto sucede porque estamos intentando buscar soluciones dentro de un sistema estructuralmente racista y no las vamos a encontrar simplemente porque los cuerpos negros eh, y los cuerpos africanos y afrodescendientes no tienen el mismo valor en este sistema, con lo cual sí que quiero mostrar mi solidaridad y mi apoyo en seguir resistiendo y en continuar eh, a, a trabajar y a resistir y a luchar y a denunciar, pero después de 18 años trabajando en migraciones y en frontera, yo creo que dentro de ese sistema no vamos a conseguir que nos traten como seres humanos. Esto es mi, y sé que suena un poco pesimista, pero es lo que, lo que siento y después de, de tantos años es, es, es lo que pienso. Creo que hay que destruir el sistema porque no, no vamos a ningún sitio. Aún así, eh, bueno, voy a, voy a contextualizar un poquito a nivel europeo, a nivel de España. También hablar, cuando hablamos de violencia policial, quiero hablar de violencia de, de fuerzas y eh, cuerpos de seguridad del Estado y de algunos espacios donde, si la impunidad es la norma, pues hay otros espacios donde la, la violencia, la impunidad y la falta de justicia está totalmente aceptado y permitido por ciertas políticas y, y ciertas administraciones. Eh, en, voy a hablar de un caso en particular, y este caso en particular es la norma. En 2014, bueno, no sé si las personas aquí están familiarizadas, pero bueno, eh, en España tenemos personas que llegan por barco a las fronteras, eh, a las costas españoles, y aparte tenemos personas que intentan saltar fronteras eh, que se llaman smart borders, militarizadas, para llegar a las costas a, a territorio español, ¿no? que son los territorios eh, de Ceuta y Melilla. Eh, los espacios de frontera, eh, desgraciadamente, pues no, no sé, por parte de la administración y, y de las conversaciones que tenemos, no, digamos que el Estado no hace ninguna relación entre el racismo y la violencia. Eh, la, violencia eh, la violencia física, las detenciones, las deportaciones... Eh, disparar sobre personas que intentan cruzar, no, no digamos que se justifican bajo la, 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 los, los motivos de, de defender fronteras, de que hay una cierta ilegalidad en que las personas están, están cometiendo, bajo eh, argumentos de seguridad, es decir, son espacios donde cabe cualquier tipo de violencia, cabe cualquier tipo de falta de acceso a un procedimiento o a, a hacer una solicitud de asilo, a ser tratada como una persona simplemente porque eh, es un espacio donde se justifica eh, en pro de la seguridad y de la defensa, defensa contra civiles que, que no están armados, pero bueno, se justifica esta violencia. ¿no? En el 2014, y este caso es la norma, eh, había aquí unas 40 personas eh, llegaron por, por, por costas ¿no? a, a Ceuta, llegaron a una playa de, de Ceuta que se llama El Tarajal, y eh, en algún momento pues saltaron al agua, empezaron a nadar, eran chicos africanos, eh, saltaron a, a, al mar y empezaron a nadar y la Guardia Civil que estaba en, en la playa, que les estaba observando, empezó a disparar contra ellos y les mató. Eh, vio, les vio, eh, vio cómo se estaban ahogando y los que nos estaban ahogando pues se aseguraron de dispararles para, para, que, para que se ahogaran. ¿no? Han pasado siete años. Eh, varias organizaciones han denunciado el caso y bueno, pues hasta ahora, después de siete años, no ha habido ningún tipo de, de justicia, no ha habido ningún tipo, tipo de reparación, eh, no ha habido ningún tipo de, ningún tipo de rendición de cuentas. Entonces, eh, y esta, esta violencia contra los cuerpos negros en materia migratoria, donde se permite todo, eh, es en España, pero es en todas partes en Europa. Eh, hay un informe muy interesante que igual os puede interesar, que fue publicado por, por Equinox, en el que, bueno, yo soy parte del comité ejecutivo de Equinox, 
en que hemos analizado casos en Francia, en Alemania, en República Checa, en Rumanía, es lo mismo. Las personas negras y afrodescendientes que llegan a la frontera o que están eh, bajo control de la policía o que están detenidas acaban o matadas en, en, en detención policial o matadas a causa de una persecución o disparadas o heridas. Eh, entonces es algo, como decía, ¿no? es algo sistemático, es algo estructural. No, no sé si... Eh, no, no tengo respuestas sobre las formas de, de resistencia, ¿no? Y, y bueno, pues eh, para terminar, quiero hacer una pequeña mención, ¿no? Hemos estado haciendo incidencia para que desde la Unión Europea el plan contra el racismo incluyera eh, algún tipo de legislación para eh, determinar que existe eh, racismo estructural dentro de, de las fuerzas del orden, no hemos conseguido. El plan europeo antirracismo eh, del año europeo no incluye una mención a que existe el racismo estructural dentro de, de las fuerzas eh, del orden. Entonces, eh, pues no sé, no sé, no sé qué decir. Yo creo que, como dice Adrián, ya, ya tengo que terminar hay que cambiar de sistema. Así que quiero agradecer el espacio, eh, dar mucho, mucho ánimo a todas las personas que estáis trabajando y luchando, deciros que esto es muy duro y que, y que bueno, pues aquí estamos para, para la solidaridad y para seguir trabajando. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias a ti, mi mamá, por tu reporte, tus palabras, por hacer este análisis y tener también empatía con el dolor de todas las personas que estamos acá y que hemos sido de alguna forma atravesadas por la violencia y la brutalidad policial y el racismo estructural de distintos estados. Gracias a los panelistas por contar su historia y por enseñarnos cómo nuestras situaciones son diferentes, pero a la vez similares como personas afrodescendientes alrededor del mundo. Es importante también unirnos para cobrar esta deuda impagable, esta deuda impagable que tienen los estados hacia nosotros. Este sistema, como decía Adrián, hay que destruirlo. Este sistema antinegro, antiindígena, antitrans, antiqueer, hay que destruirlo y pensar en un sistema más vivible, eh, con justicia y con justicia sanadora, justicia restaurativa también. Ahora me gustaría dar a las expertas del recién creado Mecanismo Internacional de Expertas y Expertas Internacionales, una oportunidad para hablar con la familia, entendiendo que este es un asunto grande y que el organismo, un organismo como la ONU en, puede resolver, pero está en conversación eh, siguiendo a detalles este, estos casos. Y es importante este espacio especialmente para que las familias sean escuchadas por los funcionarios de la ONU. Entonces, en este sentido, demos la bienvenida a las expertas Raiz Kisi de los Estados Unidos y Justice Yvonne Mokogoro de Sudáfrica. Cuando quiera, tienen la palabra. Can I just try to fix the lighting? Mm. Not quite. I'm sorry, the lighting is not what it should be. Um, but uh, I have been here all the time. You have seen me. Uh, I think you see just the shadow of my, of my image. But as long as you can hear my voice, I hope uh, it will be sufficient for now. You know what, when I came here, and accepted the invitation as an expert to hear the voices of uh, the victims and people who have been directly impacted by uh, 
racism and uh, discrimination and uh, all these violations by law enforcement. I knew exactly that I would be sitting here and listening to you with a heart that is breaking into pieces. And, and I feel that way because I'm sitting here and listening to people who have been directly impacted and who lived and experienced the reality of brutality against Africans and people of African descent by law enforcement. You live the reality. And it is natural that one would um, respond this way. But uh, there's work to do. As you have all uh, recognized, each one of you who has um, given a testimony has mentioned in one way or another that uh, we need to find solutions. So there is work to do. And among others, the United Nations in the Human Rights Commission's uh, resolution 47 uh, forward uh, slash stroke 21 has created this mechanism. We have uh, mechanisms and bodies at the United Nations who deal with racism generally and worldwide. But uh, the UN has not had up to now a body or a mechanism like this whose specific mandate is um, to uh, address and deal with uh, racism, discrimination, brutality uh, against Africans and people of African descent in the context, of course, of law enforcement and criminal justice generally. And uh, this mandate is exercisable worldwide. But you know, the way we will approach addressing particularly systemic racism, because that is important. Systemic racism, although we also have a man, that's a big part of under our, our mandate, we are also required to focus on specific incidents. If there are specific incidents at a particular point in time or incidents that have already occurred, they must be brought to our attention and our mandate enables us to uh, address those. So systemic brutality, uh, individual, specific cases, as long as they fall within our mandate and it is brutality or um, racism, race discrimination against Africans and, Africa and, and people of African descent, it falls squarely within our mandate and uh, we are authorized to address and deal with it. How we will, uh, uh, look at systemic racism, we have decided to identify um, specific countries uh, which have, uh, where it has shown that uh, systemic racism, individual uh, cases occur and has occurred uh, throughout the system. And uh, because we cannot visit every country. So we have identified kind countries which we will visit 
and um, in the spirit of uh, trying to bring solutions as you have all suggested. And uh, we will look at the systems of those countries and discuss with role players in the particular uh, uh, country. We will also in those countries have discussions with uh, law enforcement, uh, victims and families of victims, or should I say, uh, victims and uh, uh, survivors of pr police brutality and their families. In other words, all of those who have been directly affected in those countries. We will have discussions with uh, civil society who work in the field of uh, uh, fighting against racism, uh, against Africans and people of African descent in the particular country or region. Sometimes we will invite people from the region if it makes our task easier, but we will do our country visits. We have already written to some countries um, asking them or letting them know that uh, we would like them to invite us because uh, we would like to look at these issues. And um, we have a mandate of three years and three years, trust me, from what you have uh, given us today, we have recognized that three years is not enough to solve the brutality, police brutality issues of the world. And that is why we need to work smartly so that uh, we uh, address uh, areas where there is um, a number or, or where statistics show that uh, there are issues with regard to pr police brutality. We have, uh, as soon as we started operating, we were appointed last year in December, on the 15th of December. And as soon as we were appointed, before we even went to Geneva for a five day session from our homes, we met immediately, had discussions with uh, civil society and uh, some, uh, law enforcement at UN level so that we have an idea what the issues are and uh, had discussions with uh, those who are aware of uh, what we call the hotspot uh, uh, countries where these issues occur extensively, that is civil society. And we also looked at the report of the human rights, the, the high commissioner of the human rights uh, uh, council of uh, who identified certain countries in her report. And uh, it is from there that we got our list of countries that we have to visit. And you have, all of you who have spoken here have shown that indeed those countries need to be attended to with regard to these issues. You come from those countries. You have told us uh, uh, what the issues are, some of those countries. A number of you come from those countries. You have told us what the issues are. And this informs and enlightened us as to approach and uh, uh, the need to uh, visit these countries as soon as possible, although the protocols do not really uh, uh, depend on us. We depend on the availability of uh, the people who are in the forefront of the systems that we have to examine when we visit those countries. But uh, I feel that uh, this, uh, uh, conversation with these testimonies has, has sharpened 
the need for us to uh, try and get this country visits as soon as possible. It has sharpened the need for us to work smartly. It has sharpened the idea that we must all work together to uh, find solutions. And uh, we are still going to meet with civil society. We are still going to meet with families and victims who have experiences in these issues. We are still going to meet even with law enforcement themselves because we have to look at the systems and try to find solutions. We are also going to visit, to visit um, uh, countries where we, their systems may play a role in um, showing us how systems can work. And if uh, you can identify countries where the systems do work, we can also visit those countries so that um, we find ways of resolving uh, the systems of uh, countries which, which are in the forefront of uh, police brutality. What we have been mandated to do is to report to the Human Rights Committee within the three years, three times within the three years or annually within the three years of our mandate. And our first report is going to be in September of this year. So all of these conversations and um, testimonies will uh, give us an idea what to include in our report. We have dealt with uh, uh, data, the need to have data when we uh, report uh, the, the, the goings on of police brutality because numbers don't lie. If we, have, if we get data, we hope that it would be, our reports will be convincing. And this first report is going to deal with the need for, to, to collect disaggregated data to show how uh, country systems treat uh, Africans and people of African descent through their policing systems. The numbers will show, and uh, we have our first report uh, sometime in some September, as you say, as I said, but we will report every year. And uh, our approach is to have conversations like this and uh, to ask for information to visit countries and speak to all role players from the highest officials in the state, throughout the highest officials and the uh, foot soldiers of law enforcement to communities who have experienced and who have been affected by police brutality and civil society who spent their lives trying to assist families and um, resolve these issues. So uh, we have uh, a mandate to listen, to be the voices of those who seem to be voiceless and get their voices to reach the United Nations through our reports and recommendations. Our reports must have recommendations to try to resolve. And uh, these recommendations will reach the United Nations General Assembly through the Human Rights Committee to whom we submit our report and they transmit our report to the General Assembly. So the long and short of it is that I appreciate 
truly appreciate this invitation. I appreciate it because it has got us to start to think about the impact that this treatment has on families and those who have been impacted. And uh, we know what questions to ask, what uh, areas of police brutality we need to prioritize. And uh, for that reason, and I speak on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Tracy Kizzi, who is here with me, and unfortunately, Professor Juan Mendez had a prearranged engagement and he could not be here. But I think I speak on behalf of all of us, all three of us, when I say we truly appreciate the invitation and the openness with which you, test, you gave your testimonies. And uh, for that reason, um, we feel grateful that we have been invited. Um, my colleague Tracy, Do Dr. Kasi, might want to give a final word or two, if uh, um, I may ask you, Chairperson, I might have missed it's one or two to issues. To and uh, can I ask her through you? Do, to, do I have uh, a minute? A yes, yes, no problem. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you, because I know we're at time, Madam yeah. Chair, and I <laughs> promise I will only take a few minutes if yes. I could. Thank you so much. And, and from where I sit, it is good morning, um, good afternoon. And thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to all of you who are on the screen and so bravely shared your stories. And I do, I feel it. I feel it through the screen, although I am very tired of being on Zoom and cannot be there with you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I will echo what Madam Kuro said in regards to what our mandate is, and I will not repeat that, but I will simply say to you that part of our role is to provide solutions to those particular states and countries. And I want to reiterate that those solutions have to be centered around those who are victims and survivors and families. And it is critical that those solutions are centered and focused in that way. Otherwise, we are just repeating history. We're doing the same out. So I always like to say to folks on the ground who do the work with me. And I think that why that is so important to me, and for those of you who do not know my history, most of my history is in policing. And that includes being an officer and doing the work. And with the work that we do with CPE, the Center for Policing Equity, um, this is the work that I do on the ground with community and with policing and centering um, community and using the data to do that work. I also want to be very clear that when we do this work moving forward, we are about how do we hold these systems accountable. In a lot of ways, that accountability is going to look different in different places and different spaces. But the one thing that has always been very clear is the one group that can hold them accountable is civil society, is community. And that requires a shifting of power. And that's the one thing I don't hear people say a lot. It looks very different. And that power means that that power has to be exercised. And that exercising, and I think as I heard from one of, one of our, our family members and everybody's fam to me, no matter where you are, that oftentimes when you exercise it, it can be very dangerous. That is a concern and that is a concern that we are going to lift. And I think, um, I know Madam Okuro certainly has lifted this a number of times that when you are voicing for the voiceless, your life should not be in danger in doing that. And we recognize that. And whether you're in the States where I'm at or whether you're in another country, whether it's Brazil, whether it is in Spain, that should not be. And that includes those of us who are in my trans family, um, however you identify, however you choose to, African, African descent, those of us who are in the intersection, it is very real. 
And oftentimes you find people who do not get it and who do not understand it. We also need to make sure that that is a part of our charge as well. And oftentimes those things get lost in the margins. So I, I say all of this um, for my colleagues as well, is that we clearly understand that we are a global family and historically that has not been the case. But I do know this, that we are talking about systems that, not are, that are not just specifically about police. This is about a safety system that has failed us. And so as we do our work, and um, Justice McCora mentioned this, this is three years, three years is not a lot of time. And so whatever we do, we do together, we do, we must sustain. And as we sustain and we look at how we can put things in place that can carry on and think about how we go into certain locations and take what is working and share that and make sure we share that in a way in which people can understand it, take pieces of it and plant it in other places. I think we can begin to do that work and continue the work, not that it's not happening, but to make sure that we set up also communications across many varying ways that we can always share this work and make sure that it continues. So I say all this again, for us that are doing this work, please stay safe. I know that it is exhausting work. I know that it's tiring work, but as it was said so eloquently, we do this not only for ourselves, our communities, but for our future and for our children. I'm a grandmother as well, and we have still so much work to do. We are here, we are listening, and we will do our part to amplify what we need to amplify to make sure that those voices are not lost. I look forward to the work over the next three years. I believe our email has been dropped into the chat. Please use it. Um, I'm sure we're gonna have questions as we move forward. So you'll be hearing from us quite a bit. And I do look forward to hearing from you moving forward and hearing about the work on the ground. That's where I do my work. And so if you need anything else from us, please let us know. I'm sure we'll be counting on you for a few questions I know I'm gonna have. So please stay safe. All of my energy to you and your family and to all of the work that you're doing, please keep going. And I know how hard it is, but you have all of us. So please, peace be with you. And we will meet again really soon. So I will turn it back over to the moderator. Thank you, thank you very much. Gracias a ustedes. Agradezco al mecanismo de expertos y expertas por sus palabras y por su acompañamiento durante el día de hoy. También a las familias por su valentía, por la energía, por el amor puesto acá. Eh, esto es bastante difícil, pero estamos juntas, nos junta la diáspora, nos junta el dolor eh, en este sistema necropolítico que nunca para para exterminarnos, pero estamos también con las ancestras pidiendo justicia, pidiendo reparación y justicia significa que esto no vuelva a pasar nunca más. Justicia no significa el sistema de prisiones o la justicia punitivista. Justicia significa sanar este dolor, que es un dolor que siempre vamos a tener en nuestro cuerpo. Justicia significa que ninguna persona negra, afrodescendiente, indígena, afroindígena, cimarrona, muera por la brutalidad policial y por el racismo estructural. Entonces, eh, me siento muy emocionada también por haber compartido este espacio y por haber compartido mi experiencia vital también, que es muy difícil hablar de esto en primera persona, pero estoy en confianza, estoy entre hermanas, hermanes, hermanos que logramos hacer un lazo fuerte para mantenernos vivas y para decir que nuestras vidas importan, que somos una materia viva que exige justicia a cada día. Gracias por su tiempo, gracias por la energía, blessing, bendiciones y ache. Y recordamos si hay alguna pregunta, eh, pueden seguir escribiendo en el chat con su nombre y su correo. Gracias a todas, gracias a Salima y gracias también a Lamar. Y ahora Lamar, eh, Salima, si quiere decir algo. Sí, Salima. No, <ríe> eh, 
<laughs> yeah, so I'm sorry. I just want I don't have anything to add. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm uh, Salima Hankins, and I uh, support the coordination of the UN Anti-Racism Coalition. I want to thank everyone for um, uh, just telling your stories, and thank you to the moderator for doing such an amazing job. I don't really have anything to add. Everything that people have said um, really just, I think, was said much better than I could. I just wanted to talk a little bit about, um, briefly about next steps. Um, and uh, uh, that the coalition is planning to have another side event in September that will be focused a bit more on the looking at the broader systems. Um, and I just wanted to reflect back a little bit what some of the family members were saying that they wanted, you know, justice, respect, solidarity. These are things that were universal. And the thing that binds them is this like sort of um, global anti-Blackness and this um, uh, history of colonialism and linked to the transatlantic slave trade. Just so, so the important, thinking about the importance of looking at the systems as well as the, the individual stories, which are really impactful. Um, again, if people have questions for the families, we wanted to leave this space mostly for people to tell their stories. Please, um, I will drop our emails in the ch chat. Please email us and we will forward those. And if they, the family members want to respond, then they can. If you have any questions, please reach out to us as well if you want to. And then we can help to facilitate those um, connections. The last thing I wanted to say is that it's important for us as a coalition to make sure that we're centering these voices and creating space and, and access and uh, opportunity for people to speak directly to um, these uh, um, spaces in the UN where, where potentially change can happen. So uh, if you are interested in no knowing more about the coalition, also reach out to us if you're interested in joining the, co the coalition and just really being in solidarity with each other. I think a lot of this is about solidarity and not only sharing each other's pain, but also sharing each other's healing um, and connecting and really getting to see that people are experiencing similar things around the world and how can we act collectively to, uh, to address this. Like no one person has the solutions but together we start to get, chip away at it more and more. So thank you everyone for, for taking the time to join us. And we'll leave the, this open a little bit more for people to, to, to chat. Thanks. Bye everyone. Thank you, gracias, obrigada, thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you so much for coming. And um, thank you speaking. to the translators. Thank you to Afro Resistance uh, for awesome job translating. Thank you to Sergio as well. Just like, um, just really appreciate the, um, like the fact that you are members of the coalition and then also are, are able to do the translation. A wonderful rest of the week. Obrigada. Tchau, tchau, gente. Muito obrigada. Muito obrigada, Vanessa. Obrigada. Tchau, gente. Tchau. Tchau a todos. Fuerza, fuerza.